<laughs> no, it's, but yeah, you're funny. I mean, you you know, dude. I, I remember I was like, an, I was thinking about this other day when I started. Like when I was nine year old, nine years old, I got this freaking, I got a stupid fucking magic kit. But then I that turned into like I was started doing shows when I was like 13, 14. I was doing like I was getting like five or six gigs. I would go down to St. Christopher's Hospital in Philadelphia, and you would go, I'm gonna just go do a show for the kids. You'd go, oh, that's great. And so I would do it. That's how I would get better. And you're doing shows for the kids, and you know, and come out and do that. And then all these. Uh, Black nurses that worked there said, "Well, you got to come to our church. You got to come to our church." And so, like, I go, "All right, yeah." And I got, came out, so I would get these gigs. And my old man would have to drive me into some of the worst neighborhoods in, in like West Philly. You know, he's in a beat up pickup truck. I got this fucking shoebox. <laughs> and we go in and do magic at these. And, I, and that's kind of I've been thinking about how long I've been performing. And I think I go, "That's like I have a, I mean, I have other jobs to pay the bills in between, but." This was always kind of like the goal. Like, I don't know how to do anything else. This is my fucking life, and I still fucking love it. Yeah, you know. So it's yeah. uh, it's really what I was getting to the Elvis thing was that I liked Elvis. Now I can't look at Elvis because I did a fucking nine month tenure under an Elvis fucking dude, impersonator. Right? an Elvis personator in Denver. I had to bring him up on Wednesday nights, and I get flashed. Like I didn't think about it for years. <laughs> So I told the story, and now I'm like, fuck. I can't believe I tolerated that beating. Everyone, and the guy would give me a small 50. You know, tell these people what a small 50 is on a Wednesday night when you're a starving comic. It's like a $2,000 check, guys, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so he would call me out, and I would go. He would feed me. The guy was a great cook. Yeah. He weighed about 300, 400 pounds. The guy was a great cook. They bought him out at one of the casinos. He was an Elvis guy for like 20, 30 years. Yeah. And that's what he did. He wanted to open up a little Italian restaurant. But he opened it up in Commerce City, Colorado, behind a bunch of truckers and shit. And it was a cute little place. It only had four, it had maybe five tables. But, you know, I've told this story before. It, till this day, I'm like, what the fuck was I thinking? Because I would have to go up, do 15, 20. He would let me do whatever. That's what why else I did it. Yeah. Because everybody else was giving you 10, 8 minutes, 7 minutes. Yeah. He would let you do 20. I would die 10 of those minutes. <laughs> but I would bring him up. So he'd come out first as the waiter. Okay? And he'd like pour the food, whatever. He, and he cooked too. So he cooked. He, he did cooked. The, waited on he him. had a waiter, a waitress. That was like his niece. And then he came out. How you doing? That's got old. Blah, blah, blah. And then he'd go, I'll be right back. Let me throw some garlic bread. And all of a sudden, dun dun dun, dun. He come out he'd, he'd come out as Elvis. He'd give me like an eyeball. like, And I'd go, oh, lady, a treat. Elvis is in the building. Coming to the stage. The great Tony is Elvis. And he would walk <laughs> through the thing and go up there. And I remember I'd have to sit there. And at first, I liked it, you know. <laughs> but then after like 20 minutes, you're like, well, how much can I? You know, it's 10 o'clock at night. And I got to put up with this guy moving his body, fat going everywhere. You could smell the celery powder because when you're fat, you're dry skin, that celery powder. Sometimes, oh. like, you can smell it. Like, I, And I used to sit there. But you know what? I became a better comic because of it. It taught me patience. It taught me how to laugh at myself. You know, the, when I lived in Seattle, there was a booker that didn't like me. I called her a fucking witch one night. I didn't like her either. But she had good rooms. And I called her one day and I go, listen, I know you don't like me. I'm not looking for a booking. Can I do guest sets in your room? And she would go, you can do whatever the fuck you want. I could care less. So every, I knew she hated me. So every Wednesday, I'd call her and go, hey, I'm going tomorrow night to do your show. Every, every fucking week, I would call her. Right. And one day, she's like, you're such a fucking loser for doing these rooms for free. And I'm like, not really. You're the fucking loser. You're fat. You're sitting on your ass. And at least I'm doing fucking better shows than I'd be doing if I was a regular open micer. I'm doing them in front of David Crow and all those Seattle guys, yeah. and I'm getting better. I'm improving. So what? You don't pay me. What do you pay anyway? 25 bucks? I'll do it for free and be better than you, and I'll fucking come back 10 years from now and tell you how you sucked as a book, and I'm better than you as a comic. It's a shame she died. So I never had the opportunity to come back and call her a fucking dead witch. <laughs> fucking God suckers. <laughs> but it's a real journey. And a lot of, I have a lot of guys on the Patreon that are young comics and they ask questions and stuff and I encourage them and I encourage them to stay in the game. You know, there's nothing like getting shit on and then how about getting shit on and bombing? How's that drive home for you, Yeah. Pal? 
and not getting a dime for it. And you were supposed to be home at 11, but it's 12 fucking 30, and you got to be up at 6 for work. So you just ruined tonight, today, you know, and now, but when you're a comic, you know that there's all, it's like being a street person. Tomorrow's another day. Somebody kicked my ass today, but I'm going to go home, eat a roast beef sandwich, and I'm coming back. Mm -hmm. And you better be ready for Uncle Joey tomorrow. And guess what? And if you beat me up again tonight, I'm coming back Thursday. That's comedy. Yeah. That's comedy in the beginning. And if that's not what you want to do, don't get involved in it. If you think making funny jokes on Twitter is going to get you, go ahead. But you're not, yeah, it's going to get you going for a little while. You're going to sell out big shows. You're a big shot. But what happens when you get an opportunity presented to you and you can't cover the fucking spread because yeah. you never wanted to do the work? It's like when people want a headline but nobody wants to MC. Fuck you. You're not going to make it because the MC is the quarterback of the fucking show, you dumb motherfucker. Yeah. And if you don't know how to navigate the team, how are you going to get to the fucking promised land? So think about that. Yeah, I've always said that. I always say you're gonna be great. You're gonna be a great MC. That way, you'll be a great feature act. If you're a great feature act, then you'll be a great headliner because you know that the show. Because you know the show. Show, yeah. And so, you know, I don't know what, you know, you got to do it. There's no, there's no shortcuts, and that's the one thing I love about comedy. There's no, <coughs> you can fool some of the people some of the time. You can fool all the people some of the time, but you cannot fool all the people all the time. And you can rest assured, and I'm telling you that you'll come up. The first time I worked with Kinnison, we were doing this place called Bogarts in Cincinnati, and it was this big weekend freaking thing. There was a there's a fireworks show. It's a it's a tied in with this radio station. It was like a giant giant event. And it was the first time I'm on the road with with, with Kinnison, and I, and I go out, and man, I I blank, I blank for like 30 seconds, and someone yelled something. I said, "Shut the fuck up!" And it got me out of it, and I slowly, slowly got the set back and started getting them. And by the end of the set, I had them fucking going. I had to go, and I was able to, yeah, I was able to go, okay, I kind of pulled it up. I pulled out, I was headed for the side of the mountain, <laughs> pulling up, we did the white knuckle pull up, and then I walk off, I said, that's it, I'm a, probably not going to work with Sam anymore, because I forget, and he goes, and he said to me, he goes, no, I says, I would have rather have you seen that set, because now I know you can handle it. You know, there's no many guys would have tanked that set, no many guys would have tanked that set, you you were able to pull it up, now, now I know you can handle it. Some guys would have just fucking continued down, but so, yeah, but... You got to do those things until you get until you can do those things on stage. Like you said, you, you if you don't do all those other shows, all those little shows, you won't know how to pull it up and say and save a set. So, like it's interesting. I didn't get on stage for like a year. I got on stage a couple of weeks ago at Uncle Dino with my yeah. man Dino. Uncle yeah, yeah, yeah. And then Thursday night I went to, with Callan, and Saturday night. And it's funny how, you know, the first set just blew up my head. Right, it just scrambles you the night. I went with Tom Segura. Right. Then the one when I went with uh, Dino that night, I was struggling a little bit. Yeah. I could feel myself digging. The set I did Thursday night at the Stress Factory, I felt it. Like, okay. I'm yeah, it's back. back. Yeah. Three quarters back, you know. Yeah. 